After 30 years of reform and opening up, China was faced with three problems. First, huge foreign exchange trade surpluses. Second, huge overcapacity of construction materials and engineering companies. And third, access to the world restricted to her east coast through the China Seas, where the US had built 180 military bases to encircle China. To convert these problems into opportunity, in 2013, in Kazakhstan, Xi Jinping announced the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, the largest infrastructure project in history, the first phase of which was 10 times the size of the Marshall Plan in Europe after the Second World War. Through its BRI funding, China has become the biggest investor in the Middle East and Africa. In Egypt, the multi-billion dollar new administrative capital. In Saudi Arabia, the Makkah Medina high-speed rail link and the $500 billion Neon New City project. 18 European countries have joined the BRI and freight trains linking 48 Chinese cities to 42 European destinations have already completed over 10,000 journeys. By investing in the BRI, China has found a better alternative to buying US treasuries, which were low yield and high risk due to America's habit of freezing the deposits of countries considered hostile, such as Iran. Through the BRI projects, China consumed and exported her excess capacity in construction materials and skills. Through the BRI with its nine routes, three sea routes, three land routes to the west, and three corridors to the oceans to the south. China created alternative routes that bypassed the 180 U.S. military bases that could blockade the China seas if the U.S. turned hostile. China moved fast. By 2019, in six years, 3,000 Belt and Road projects costing $3.87 trillion were under construction, reaching 65 nations and benefiting 4.6 billion people. China's foreign surpluses were deployed, her excess capacity in construction consumed and the US stranglehold on the East Coast rendered ineffective due to the nine new routes of the BRI and the string of pearls, the ports, in Vietnam, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Gwadar and Djibouti that secured the Indian Ocean. The most important exit for China to avoid the US blockade of the China Seas to the east is the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor that runs from Xinjiang to Gwadar on the Indian Ocean at the mouth of the Persian Gulf. America decided this had to be stopped and supported movements to destabilize the route. Xinjiang is the gateway to the West. It was essential to keep it open and under control. Instability in Xinjiang could upset the whole apple cart of the Belt and Road. China came back hard with its re-education centers to control dissident Uyghurs. China found an easy entry to countries such as Iran, Zimbabwe and Sudan, which the US had declared pariah states. Pakistan had also moved from the American to the China camp. The US was no longer a serious buyer of Arab oil, whereas China, with its daily oil purchases of 10 million barrels, was the most important customer. The region's commercial interests lay with China, selling oil to China and buying goods from China. 50% of China's oil and gas came from the Middle East. Beyond lay Africa, with its 54 countries and 1.3 billion population, once ruled from the imperial capitals London and Paris, Africa had for a time become a vassal of the American empire. Now dependent on China's support and money, it became known as China's second continent. 
The West took Africa's natural resources, but left her poor. Now, with China's massive support, African economies started to grow. With Chinese money came Chinese infrastructure projects, China's oil purchases, and China's armament sales. The African states needed money, infrastructure, and technology, all of which China had in abundance. China needed natural resources, which Africa had in plenty. It was a natural fit. Best of all, China did not interfere in the domestic affairs of African states, unlike the U.S., which had punished them with democracy. The countries that most benefited from their relationship with China were Angola, South Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Rwanda. African countries, which saw the world's highest growth rates, included Ethiopia, 11.9%, Ivory Coast, 10%, Djibouti, 9%, Rwanda, 8.5%, and Tanzania, 8%. Cecil Rhodes was an imperialist tycoon who dominated African business in the 19th century. He died leaving a fortune of six million pounds, equivalent to a billion dollars in today's currency. Sam Pa is the new Cecil Rhodes, a small Chinese man with a goatee beard who controls the 88 Queensway Group, named after its headquarters in Hong Kong. He is reputed to have paid over $20 billion to unstable African dictators and is himself on the US sanctions list. He has intimate relations with former presidents Dos Santos, Mugabe, Hugo Chavez, and de Kirchner of Argentina. His companies, China Sonangol and China International Funds, have spread their tentacles all over Africa and beyond. The mysterious Sam Pa owns the JP Morgan Building in New York, airlines in Tanzania, oil and gas fields in Indonesia, and interests in Côte d'Ivoire, North Korea, Nigeria, Mozambique, and Russia. His companies dominate the oil industry in Angola, which exports more oil to China than Kuwait and the UAE combined. Rwanda is best remembered for its hundred days of slaughter when Hutus killed 800,000 Tutsis in a rampage of genocide. Today, under Paul Kagame, the brilliant Tutsi general who emerged as leader, Rwanda is the star practitioner of the China way in Africa. Rwanda has been called the Singapore of Africa, with the least corruption, security of life and property, the cleanest cities, and the most business-friendly government. Like Lee's Singapore, Kagame runs a police state, rejects Western notions of democracy, and prefers to follow the Chinese government principles of merit and stability to ensure fast progress. And it has worked. Bill Clinton calls him one of the greatest leaders of our time. Hutus and Tutsis live in peace. 56% of his parliament members are women. A quarter of his budget is spent on education. He does not accept loans from the World Bank. Rwanda has a Chinese-speaking, Chinese-trained military brigade. Rwanda has less murders as a percentage of her population than the United States. Rwanda, one of the world's least corrupt countries, is the 15th fastest growing economy in the world. Rwanda's success raises the question, is the Chinese way a better solution to poverty than the democracy of the West? The China-US relations moved from enmity in the Korean War to an alliance against the USSR after the historic Nixon-Mao meeting in 1972. China was admitted as a full member of the WTO 
in 2001, after which trade relations grew. By 2010, China had become the world's second largest economy and her trade surplus raised tensions in America as China became her biggest creditor. Under Trump, the relationship broke down altogether as he accused China of cheating, currency manipulation and theft of intellectual property. America just could not accept that its position as the world's sole superpower was seriously under threat. China surpassed the US in its infrastructure, manufacture and the number of its STEM students, science, technology, engineering and mathematics and in the number of billionaires. As trust disappeared, suspicion became antagonism. Are the two superpowers now at war? 20th century war was fought with bullets and bombs in a violent struggle to kill enemy soldiers and capture territory. War in the 21st century is very different and comprises of trade war, tech war, cyber war and destabilizing the enemy. Trump started with the trade war. He applied US tariffs to $550 billion of Chinese goods. China retaliated with tariffs on $185 billion of US goods. Trump claimed victory, but the burden of the extra tariffs was merely transferred to US businesses who lowered profit margins and to US consumers in the form of higher prices. The trade war seemed to go nowhere. A phase one trade deal was signed, but seemed inconclusive. The trade war damaged both superpowers and its fallout depressed the world economy in a scenario best described as all pain with no gain. The trade war was overshadowed by the terrible coronavirus.